We are here with Stephanie Patel. She has had two near-death experiences, one when she was a kid and the other one when she was around 20 years old. And she has also had, let's call it an after-death communication or a channeling episode. But we're going to talk about that later. Welcome, Stephanie. How are you? I'm glad thank you're you. here. Thank you. And thank you for, for having me here to talk to you. Yes. I would like to start out talking about your uh, near-death experience when you were a child. I think that's an interesting point, uh, starting point. I was three years old, and so obviously I have limited memories, although I have heard this story from many different directions. And I was lost in the wilderness um, because we lived in McGrath, Alaska. And so I wandered away in the middle of the winter, or in the winter, and I... I don't know exactly what happened, but I think what happened is I fell into a little pond and I was told that I um, actually asphyxiated rather than drowned on some frozen algae. And uh, so I wasn't found for quite a while. And uh, when I was found, I was pretty cold. And uh, my dad was not the one that found me. Somebody else found me. And called my dad over. The search party was out, of course. And uh, he, he, uh, they took me to a shack, like a fish drying shack that was out there. And they lit a fire out front because it was 1954. And so they didn't have much modern equipment in McGrath, Alaska, which is right in the middle of Alaska. You know, you could get there by airplane, riverboat, or dog sled. That was pretty much it. And uh, so he kept working on me to try to get me to breathe. And he finally did get me to breathe after I'd been gone for quite a while. Because, you know, small children can freeze. If they freeze suddenly, they can be revived after a significant period of time. It's like their whole body system shuts down. I think the record is like 90 minutes or something. And they're, it, when they're small, they're, their system just shuts down if they're frozen. And especially if it's a drowning or something. And so he did get me to breathe again. Took me home and they called to Anchorage on the shortwave radio to get directions on how to warm up my body to not cause any more damage. And so I was fine. But I could not stop talking about my experiences in heaven. <laughs> And my mother did not like it because she had been raised as a very, very strict Catholic. And therefore, she told me the only one who could die and come back is Jesus. And if you tell me that you died and came back, then that's sacrilege. And I think she was afraid of two things. She was either afraid I was schizophrenic because I was talking to my friends after that in heaven. And she was afraid that I, that I had a devil in me. So she didn't know which way to go. But she just told me I must never talk about it. And she told my, my brothers and sisters that they are just tell me I dreamed it or I was lying. And uh, the story that my father shares is that when one day I would, I could still talk to those in heaven telepathically as I can now. And I told her that my friends would feel sad if I didn't talk to them. And she slapped me across the face. And my dad said, don't touch her anymore between this, between me and her from now on. And so my dad stepped in. And so I only talked to my dad about it after that. And not to my mother. And my dad died when I was nine years old. And then I was kind of on my own. Can you tell me more or less about the experience itself? You said you came back talking, saying that you had been in heaven and that you were talking with your friends that you met in heaven? Is that so? Uh, can you more or less explain well, it a little bit better? I don't, I don't remember everything that happened, of course, because I was only three, and I'd been told never to talk about it. And I think I threw a temper tantrum for two years straight, you know, because I was so distraught. Um, so I can only tell you what I know about it, about the actual experience, because I'm in communication now, and I know more about it. And 
have had just a little teeny bit of memories about it. So I have a little bit of memory that just kind of popped up spontaneously. Because when you're three, sometimes it's just part of your life and you don't even think too much about it after that. And uh, was that I had to meet certain people on the other side that would be important in my life. And apparently when I came back, I told my mother or my father that God would be waiting for my dad and not to worry about it. And so that kind of freaked her out a little bit, like, does that mean he's going to die soon? And in fact, he did die six years later when, when he was 42 years old. Wow. So uh, you also had a near-death experience when you were 20 years old. Mm -hmm. So when I was 20 years old, I'd had a very rough life, and I decided to end it all. I took some pills. And uh, I died. And I didn't, I also don't have a lot of memories about this because probably because I'd already, everybody already thought I was kind of crazy. And the last thing I wanted to know was even to think about it. In fact, the doctor came in with a bunch of, was in a hospital, and he came in the next morning with a bunch of interns with him. And he said, do you? want to know what happened last night to you? And I said, no, <laughs> do not talk to me about it. Because, you know, I just said no, because I didn't want to hear about it because it was because I had had that experience when I was three and I and my family was very materialistic. And anytime I would talk about any of my experiences, they would freak out. For instance, when I was nine years old, and we had moved or 10 after we'd moved from Alaska, and my mother uh, did not really love me. Um, I think she was always a little afraid of me. Um, so after my dad died, I was kind of, things got kind of bad. And I was in this, cat put in this Catholic church and it, our school, and it was just awful. It was just awful. And I was so miserable. I just wanted to die. And one day I'm sitting there and I would kind of go catatonic, you know, where they would kind of come up and say, wake up. And I'm staring in my, in my, sitting in my seat in my classroom, and I'm staring ahead, and I see this figure in a light appear in front of me. And it says to me, don't look at them, look at me. Don't look at them, look at me. And from that, I took the message that I should just focus on my own path and upon my own discovery and not pay attention to what other people were saying, not listen to them because they didn't know. And so... I never told anybody about that because I didn't want them to lock me up, you know, it, and put me in an insane asylum. You know, people just didn't relate to that kind of thing. So when I was 20 and I had this experience, I knew I died. And I knew it came back, but I didn't want to think about it because I didn't know what had happened because, you know, it's been now 17 years since I had that experience when I was three. I'd been told never to talk about it, that I was a, had the devil in me, that, you know, that I was schizophrenic, whatever. And so, and I had other experiences where people had said things to me like that. So I didn't want to think about it. I didn't want to tell anybody about it. I just didn't know how to interpret it even because in my Catholic upbringing, there was no way to interpret it. Well, what when happened? Ex dies. What happened? What happened exactly? Or do you remember more or less what happened when you were 20? Well, vaguely, um, what happened was I just felt like I, well, first thing was I, I felt like I was moving around the hospital, seeing things. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't, again, I didn't want to think about it. And just because it was too weird for me to fit into my framework and my family and stuff. And I was far from my family at that time. I was away at college. So I never told them about this. I never told my mother that I had essentially my heart had stopped. I had died. And what had happened is I was alone when I took the pills. And then I went, I got frightened because I started I was just taking whatever pills I had and I became frightened <clears throat> and I went down the street to some people I knew. And then I guess I collapsed on the sidewalk 
And they, that was the last I remembered at that point, and they called the ambulance. Okay, a lot of these memories I had to bury because I just couldn't. I, I was very, very fragile, very fragile in terms of my mental state. I knew that I came back, that I had died, and I came back. I knew that. There was never a doubt in my mind about that. And it wasn't until years later that I got it all came back to me, um, which sometimes happens, I think. But I had gone to visit somebody while I was out of body. He was the same person that I had to connect with when I was three in heaven. And I said to him, you know, this is Stephanie. And um, I live in the north and you'll find me in North Dakota which is where I lived, not where I was at the time in college, but where I lived. And he perceived of it as a dream, a very vivid dream. So he did, he told me that he remembered the name and my face. Who is he? His name is Steve. Okay, so you say, you mentioned that in, two, in 2015, two individuals who were dead showed up and that one of these was uh, Steve Jobs, and the other one, right. uh, the other one was Carl Jung, Thomas Jefferson. Oh, you want to tell the story? After I came back from my from that experience, my life changed. So uh, to me, each of these experiences was like I was getting a boost of energy boost along the way to keep me on my path. And so, I. Um, change my name. I just said, I, you know, I have to change my name now. So I changed it to Stephanie. It was Dorothy. And the other thing that I brought back with me was that I should not try it again. That if I didn't get it right, you know, I just have to come back and do it again, you know, over and over sort of like Groundhog Day <clears throat> for our soul journeys, that if we don't get it right, we just have to come back and do it over. I'm not condemning suicide by any means because I don't think that way. I'm just saying for me, it was a point at which I had to understand that I had to keep trudging along and figure it out because that there were other things that were important that for me to figure it out. And so I needed to figure it out. And so I did. Let's move on and talk about Steve Jobs. Uh, did you ever meet Steve in person? And uh, what is your relationship with him? You say that you have been channeling him since uh, for some years now, and that he has given you many important messages, and that you also have received half communications, that you, all, you also have communications with other uh, let's call them intellectuals of the uh, from the other side. So some of them, they've been, you know, infamous or they've been, you know, famous or they've been anonymous, like so many people. But they choose those particular lifetimes because they're important to them. And they think that people will relate to them by coming through from those lifetimes. What about Steve um, Jobs? Can you? How did you communicate with him? Did you meet him in person? And what, what's your relationship? No, we agreed before this lifetime what was going to happen because our last life together, which was very, very powerful lifetime, we I died in Auschwitz. Um, and I know about our past lives together because over the last seven and a half years, we have untangled a lot of knots. Um, so we agreed before we were born and that, that uh, we would, we had connection dates. Let's put it that way. So to give you an example of one connection date. After my dad died in 1959, now Steve is several years younger than I. So when I crossed over when I was three, I met Steve, who had his identity already before he came into this world. And he told me he'd be coming back for me. Um, and I was only three, of course, so, you know. My understanding of all this was a little difficult, although I did tell my dad, I said, Dad, I have to tell you, Daddy, I have to tell you. 
that someday somebody named Steve is going to come for me. So you'll know that what I tell you is true. But my dad died when I was nine. And uh, so after my dad died, my mother made plans to move to a little town, a town, I don't know how long it was, but a town in California named Mountain View. Steve lived in Mountain View at that time as a little boy. And I know this is true because I have a letter that got passed down through the generations that my mother had sent to my grandmother and eventually found its way back to us where my mother talks about it, that she's going to take us to Mountain View, California, because my dad did not want us to go back to North Dakota. He wanted us to be along the West Coast. And she wrote this letter to my grandmother that confirms all this. I didn't actually know all this until I read the letter. And then I was like, wow, that's pretty strange. Well, her uncle, or my uncle, her brother, that she was going to take us to stay with, lived about a little more than a mile from where Steve lived at that time. So this was the first connection point at which we were to connect. Okay, you mentioned that you can communicate and talk to Steve and that Steve has, uh, you have discussed many things about your past life with him and that you can actually uh, communicate with him now if you would like. About two years ago, we just we found the method of using the pendulum and this okay letter board, just just a piece of dime store, you know, crystal okay. with a piece of dental floss attached to it. And okay. we nothing special. We uh, found that this was effective because it helped me so that I didn't have to be off in a quiet place or something. I could do it while I'm talking to you without thinking about it. Do can you can lunch. you show the, the can you turn can you turn the camera yes, towards I can show you. So I, we, yeah so we can I see can, I can I can show you how it works by lowering this yeah, a bit briefly okay uh, but it gives me more confidence and it also helps them to spell out words like names and stuff that I don't get and so I just follow the pendulum at the same time that I hear the words so for instance I can ask Steve are you here. And if he's here, he'll swing it uh, um, clockwise. What are, you, what are you saying? Hold on. Do you want me to demonstrate, Steph, the pendulum, or what do you want me to do? Because I can just start talking if you want. Well, let's demonstrate the pendulum for the people. So he's swinging the pendulum. Can you swing it around as much as you can just so they can see the kind of energy that you can put into it? So you can swing it. Uh, can you swing it the other way? He's swinging it the other way already because he's this is kind of like <laughs> uh, like a trained monkey thing he's, from his perspective. So I can he's ask saying, him one question, a question, and you can ask it. Ask him. Yes, but let him let him talk first. Okay. Okay. Great. Tell him that I'm here, but I don't really like to be treated like a trained monkey because I am actually a man just like I was on earth. I don't have a body like you do in the physical realm. However, I do have a physical experience here very much like you do. And I am able to follow Steph around wherever she goes and whatever she does. I just tag along. And so I can hear everything you say. I can uh, see what's going on and I can talk about it. So just understand that I'm a man like you. I'm just not in a physical form right now. Okay. So let me put okay. this up again. Uh, my first question would be very simple. Uh, what's the afterlife like and what happens right after we die? Steve says, take it from me. There's a lot of variation, a lot of variation for me. It was the most painful experience that I could imagine. Because, you see, I didn't go right to heaven. I left my body and I wandered around the earth for years before I connected with Steph. I had so much despair in my heart that I didn't know what I was going to do. I really didn't know what I was going to do. And when I finally 
heard her call my name, I said, whoa. Finally, and I ran so fast, as I say, that I outran my past. So for me, it was pretty harsh. And it took a few more years before I took my energy to heaven. Now my energy is in heaven. I'm happy. And to drop the pendulum. I'm happy. And I can talk to people from here because I talk right through stuff. And anybody that wants to talk to me is welcome as long as they are invested in helping people on earth because that's my primary goal. As far as what other people experience, that can vary a lot. Most people come here and are greeted by loved ones or some guides and they soon find their own vibration. They will tend to gravitate to their own kind, their own soul family. And they will experience life here much as they did on Earth with one proviso. And the one proviso is that they are not stuck in it. They're not stuck in it. So if you are experiencing a trip to the beach and a storm comes up, not that a storm would come up here, but I'm just giving you an example. If you get bored with it or tired with it, or something doesn't seem right to you, you can just say, I don't want to be here. Please take me home to my castle or wherever you have chosen to reside. And so there's no challenge in the way there is on Earth. Because essentially, what you think is what you have. What you think is what you have. And it is all a trip through your own memories. Because the ideas, concept, and memories that you created while you were on Earth are what fuel your experiences here. I heard you express recently that the uh, future of mankind could lead to self-destruction. So can you, Steve, more or less explain what you said and if, how we can prevent this from happening? And why do you conclude that this is a possibility. Look around you. Are you really that blind that you can't see what's happening to Mother Earth? It's obvious. And only the ones who trust upon sticking their head in the sand cannot see it. The overpopulation in this world, the degree of depletion of the natural resources, the pollution is all leading to one result, the extinction of man. And if that's not what you want, then it's time to change the trajectory because we don't have much time left to change it. You might not see all the results for another thousand years or so, but that doesn't mean you're going to be able to turn it around in a thousand years. It may be too late. So it's no big mystery that I see. It's just a reality. And because I have lived on other planets before coming to the Earth in my soul energy, I am aware of what happened to those planets. And so I hate to see humanity make the same mistake over again, over and over again. Come on, people, let's wake up. The oldest memories that I have in my soul matrix derive from lifetimes of Nibiru which is not what a lot of people think it was. It was a planetary system in its own right because it was made up of very, very large asteroids, like little planets, that had stabilized in their orbit and revolved around the sun. And we, we were happy there, as people can be. We were pretty much like humans. We were bipeds. And we lived in families, and we had communities, and we had a trust on life and death and the rotation between heaven and our physical realm. So we are much like humanity today in the way we lived on Nibiru. 
However, we also exploited our planets. We overpopulated and we went through many, many efforts to reverse the damage. Steph could tell you about that, but we have included some of it in our book. Gale Force Winds. And eventually, the worlds could not sustain life because eventually the soil became so depleted of nutrients that it could not be saved. Even though we had great scientific knowledge and we did what we could to fix the problem, it was too late. And little by little, the population shrank because there wasn't enough access to nutrients in the soil to feed the people. If we added chemicals, which we did, they often could have an adverse effect that would cause more or at least the same amount of damage. And in the long run, humanity, as I think of it, because I still think of myself as human even in that time, began to realize that they were doomed. And the only option that they saw for the continual reproduction of their own kind was to go to space, and they did, and they became the Anunnaki. I was not one of them, nor was Steph, nor were others in our soul group, because we did not trust on living that way. We reincarnated eventually. There was many intermediary steps, but we eventually reincarnated in a small group of bipeds on Mars. They were not widely sped spread on Mars because Mars was not a very hospitable planet. But we were just happy to have an opportunity. We destroyed that planet as well, not through warfare and not through intention, but through our ignorance. Because on that planet, we created devices to sustain our lifestyle, which we maintained high above the sifting sands because the sifting sands on Mars were legendary and they could cover a house in a few years. And so we built our habitations above the surface eventually when we got enough technical knowledge to do that. And we found some problems with the walkways between the buildings that would collapse from time to time and sometimes lives were lost. And we worked on it with our scientific knowledge that we had at that time. And we concluded that a device that would, we call an anti-gravitational device, would maintain the stability of the walkways. And it did for many generations. However, unknown to us, it was having an effect on the stability of the subsurface of Mars because all of the relationships in the world and in the universe come to be either stable or descend into chaos, whatever. And in this case, it was impacting on the internal dynamics of the planet. And one day there was a big cataclysm. You might say like a big explosion because the subsurface cavities and structures were being redone because of these, the effect of the anti-gravitational device. And in that explosion, the atmosphere on Mars uh, was depleted and everyone died, of course. And then we once again were without a home. So we had to go looking for another home. And again, there were many intermediary steps as we all have to reincarnate. Don't think you're going to get away from reincarnating. You have to, just the way it is. And so we reincarnated where we could, how we could. And, and sometimes it wasn't particularly favorable because the animals were not so adept as we were accustomed to. However, we have a soul history. So our soul history followed us. And eventually, when the Anunnaki came back to the Earth to upgrade the existing hominids with their own DNA, 
in order to use them for their own purposes, which were to mine the minerals on the earth. We took that opportunity to reincarnate on earth, and we've been here ever since. Lately, you have been writing books, and these books are really not written by you. You say that you have either channeled them or that they have been dictated to you, not only by Steve, but also by a group that you call the Circle of Love. Can you tell me about that circle and what are you doing with these books? So the Circle of Love really came into uh, play a little over two years ago, about the time Steph started to work with the pendulum. And the first one that came through at that point was Tobias. And I told her I was her guide. And I won't repeat what she said. However, it took a while before we consolidated our relationship into a good friendship. And I began to realize that Steph and I were part of the same soul family and that we had been together for a long time. I found that I could talk to Steph. And I was like, wow, this is very, very unusual. However, we soon returned to our good friendship, and others began to join us in the circle. So the circle itself, the group that keeps the circle operating smoothly, is a bunch of people that vary in number between about six and a dozen. But others can also enter in to the conversations. Now, what you need to understand is that those of us in the circle of love, not all of us, but a group of us, have been together since Nibiru. And so we are very, very old friends. And we know this story very well because we've been through it before. We are here as a group that gradually coalesced, and just like any group of friends, began to sit down and talk about our problems and our issues. And little by little, we came to say, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do not only to help the people on earth, but to help ourselves? Because we're going to go back there. And what is the problem here? How can we help humanity? And so, little by little, we coalesced into a group that took on the task of writing books. There were a few that we wrote early on that were a little more scattered in focus because we really hadn't figured things out yet. However, over time, more and more souls in heaven began to come in and say, hey, I'd like to be part of this. Hey, I'd like to be part of this. And we became more focused in our current business, you might say, business project of writing books. So we write the books. Basically, what we do is Steph turns on the recorder and we talk to her and she lets it flow through her just like she is now. And then she types it up and transcribes it and puts it in a book because that's all there is to it for her. Although it's a lot of work for her, she doesn't really have to do much except transcribe. So our present project is to help humanity wake up to the reality of what's going on in the earth dimension and in the heaven dimension because they are entwined you see you can't have one without the other it would be like having time without space you can't have one and not the other because they are coextensive but the main thing that we want to get through to humanity is that you're going to reap what you sow you're going to reap what you sow those people who think that they are going to leave the earth and that's it they got in there 60, 70 years, and the earth didn't fall apart yet. And they think they're lucky stars, that they're done. And they can go now go to heaven or hell or wherever they go. Do not understand that they will come back to reap what they sow. They will be the next generations that come in and say, hey, why did they do it that way? Why didn't they protect the earth? Why did they leave us this mess? And so when people begin to understand that they're not going to get out scot-free, that they're going to have to come back because their soul will demand it. Their soul will demand that they continue to grow and to progress. And so they'll come back and 
there they'll be next to that polluted river with the ground so saturated with chemicals from the nearby plant and that it can't grow a healthy meal and they'll have to figure out what they're going to do. So do you want to wait for that day or do you want to figure it out now? If anybody wants to contact you or uh, read your books and know a little bit more about what you're doing, how can they do that? They can find my books on Amazon. They're, like I said, not my books. Books are dictated books, although I do have a novel on there. They can do that under Stephanie Patel. If they want to connect with me, look me up on Facebook under Stephanie Patel. You should be able to find me pretty easily because you can see my posts. Uh, my email is S-T-E-P-P-A-T-E-L at yahoo.com. So those would be the main reasons to find me. I also have a YouTube channel, uh, Stephanie Patel. And that basically, I've made a lot of videos public lately, but I did take them off for the same reason. You just get tired after a time of all the yahoos, I guess I'll say, who just want to make fun of what they don't understand. So well, I'm glad you came. I'm glad I met you. I'm glad you gave us this message. And I do want to continue and keep in touch with you and maybe interview you in the future. Take care. All right. Sounds good.